Thank you. We're going to hopefully in 20 minutes get through therapeutic drug monitoring. There we go. So I'm going to tell you that I think my biggest potential conflict of interest is that I'm a huge believer in therapeutic drug monitoring and the importance for optimizing the care of our patients. So as these guys have done a good job of sort of setting up, you know, we've, we've come a long way since we were dosing infliximab on demand. Induction regimen, maintenance dosing, combination therapy, all have shown to improve outcomes in our patients with IBD. However, I think we still have a bit way to go as far as completely optimizing our therapies with therapeutic drug monitoring. Gary touched on reactive testing, which is basically testing when you think someone has a, a relapse of their inflammatory bowel disease or perhaps a, a reaction to the, to the uh, anti-TNF. And that has been shown not only to be more cost effective than empiric dose escalation, but it really directs care. It gives more drug to patients that are going to respond to it and not to patients who would do better with a different medication. Proactive TDM is where I hope to focus most of this talk. Um, and also that has been shown to better, uh, it, Better, give better outcomes, and in one study at least, to be cost effective. Most of the data is in the maintenance phase, although I think it's as important, probably even more important, to really start dose optimizing these patients early in the induction phase when they have all that inflammatory burden uh, and can be leaking anti-TNF in their stool. We'll talk about when you're stopping an immunomodulator, right? Most of the data is for one year, uh, and we'll talk about uh, what I term optimized monotherapy with a biologic, sort of in lieu of, or perhaps to, in lieu of the uh, combination therapy. So Gil, as you can see his name right there, and this was the first slide I actually saw when I was, was walking in. There are no guidelines per se regarding when to do therapeutic drug monitoring and what to do with the results. But the bridge group, which I'm uh, happy to be a part of, did do a RAN panel with rigorous methodology. And in the end, we sort of determined there were four areas that it was appropriate to perform therapeutic drug monitoring. At the end of induction, in patients who were not responding, so primary non-response, patients who were losing response to therapy, secondary non-response, during maintenance and responding, and I'll show you our data, and that's sort of akin to uh, the TAXA trial as well, and restarting after a drug holiday, not before you restart the drug, but before the second infusion to help predict whether those patients are gonna have a serious uh, infusion reaction during that second uh, infusion. It was uncertain, I believe this was the question, uh, to perform testing at the end of induction in patients who are responding. I would argue even though we found it to be uncertain that it, it is still um, important to do it in these patients as well. This is just not even a full list of studies uh, looking at anti-TNF concentrations and showing how they can correlate with outcome. These are mostly cohort and post hoc analysis. Most of the studies have been done in Crohn's disease and most of the studies have been done using infliximab. But all the studies suggest what common sense, I think, would tell us is that if you had drug on board, you're going to have better outcomes, clinical remission, clinical response, harder endpoints like improvement in CRP, endoscopic healing. There is data for ulcerative colitis. There is data for the other anti-TNFs. There's even data for some of the selective adhesion molecule inhibitors as well. Uh, again, as has been mentioned, there are factors that play into the pharmacokinetics of monoclonal antibodies and how quickly someone will clear it. Antidrug antibodies, obviously bad, associated with higher clearance, concomitant immunomodulator, good, increase drug concentration of your biologic and decrease um, immunogenicity. The sicker patients, those with high baseline anti-TNFs, high CRP. Um, low albumin. These are the patients that require more drug. They have a high clearance. Those are your severe hospitalized UC, your sick Crohn's colitis. 
uh, larger people, and men also probably clear the drug a bit quicker. So let's get into the specific scenarios. I wanna to try to show some data, but really try to make it you know, something you could sort of take back to your practice. So reactive therapeutic drug monitoring, again, better directs care, it makes sense, and it's more cost effective. This is the sort of algorithm, and again, you guys will have this. As Gary mentioned, the most important thing to do when someone comes with symptoms is really have some objective evidence that this is active IBD. Once you have that, you can check your, your drug concentrations. If you have someone with a clear flare of their IBD and they have good, high concentrations of their anti-TNF, this is that patient that they're, for whatever reason, their mechanism is switched. They used to be TNF responsive and now they're not. This is someone who's gonna require a different mechanism, eustachinumab, betalizumab, or perhaps surgery. If they have subtherapeutic concentrations, no antibodies, Boom, easy, it makes sense. You give them more drug, they don't have enough drug, you give them more, they do better, and there's plenty of studies to sort of back this up. If they're antibody positive, I'm a little bit more subtle. I sort of look, are these high levels? If you have high levels of antibodies, you're gonna move on. Uh, if this is their first anti-TNF or second, you can move on to another. If they've sort of failed them all, you go on to a different medication class. Low level antibodies, I will try to overcome this. You know, most studies suggest that your first drug is your best drug. So if they have low level antibodies, I will typically increase the dose or decrease the interval. In addition, I will add on an immunomodulator to sort of boost, boost the effect, okay? My, my, my good friend, one of my man crushes, Fernando, Uma's husband, uh, did, a <laughs> did a very nice uh, uh, study, they, did, they modeled reactive testing versus sort of standard of care empiric dose escalation and nicely found reactive testing is more cost effective and more appropriately directs care than just empirically doubling the dose of the drug they're on and that was showed nicely there. There was another European prospective trial uh, that showed the same thing as well. So what about proactive TDM? And Gary set this up nicely. He actually showed one of my slides that I actually took out because I wanted to try to make it through without being too late. I'll show you data in maintenance, taking someone in on, uh, and the, the data's with infliximab, on infliximab, doing well, checking an infliximab antibody and, uh, and infliximab levels and an antibody and dose optimizing to a therapeutic window improves clinical scores, improves CRP, decreases need for rescue therapy, prolongs duration of infliximab, and at least according to one study, appears to be cost effective. This isn't a new concept, right? We all do this. I did throughout my residency and all my patients that were on gentamicin. We did it for VANC. We still do it for VANC. You know, if you're at Mount Sinai or if you're Dave Rubin, you're still using cyclosporin, and we're doing it for that, right? You, the concept is that of a therapeutic window. With certain drugs, high concentrations are associated with increased toxicity, Vank, uh, sorry, GENT and DIG are two very good examples. Low concentrations are ineffective, which makes sense. With the biologics, it's even more important. As Gary pointed out, low concentrations, undetectable drug concentrations are associated with development of antibodies, which we know leads to loss of response. Gary showed data from the TAXA trial, which is also oft misquoted as a negative study. Don't do proactive TDM because of this study. I'm gonna show you that although they missed their primary endpoint, methodologically there's plenty of reasons to think why. So they took all their patients on infliximab therapy in a stable clinical response, dose optimized them to a trough concentration of three to seven, which I'll tell you now I think is low. And they would then, and only after everybody was optimized, randomized to continued standard of care, which is dosing based on clinical symptoms or CRP, or dosing to the continued trough concentration of three to seven. And the primary outcome was only at one year. So they dose optimized everybody and then only followed them for a year. What they found early on in that group of patients that required an increased dose, they had low concentrations, they got more infliximab, they captured about 15% of patients who were just responding and now put them into remission. Importantly, CRP in these patients came down as well. You can see on the right, this wasn't the case with ulcerative colitis, but that's real only because 90% of these patients were already in remission with normal CRPs. 
At one year, there was no difference in the primary endpoint. Again, because I think everybody was optimized and they'll only fall for a relatively short period of time. And again, you can almost imagine those curves you see separating that if you continue to follow them, they're probably going to continue to separate as well. They did hit a number of secondary endpoints that favor proactive TDM. There were less patients needed rescue therapy, more patients maintained the, what, their optimal trough concentration, and less patients had undetectable uh, trough levels. In addition, there was a non-significant trend towards fewer infusion reactions, which in a lot of cases are related to antibodies. And importantly, there was a similar cost between the two groups as well. So, you know, after I had sort of seen a lot of these studies suggesting trough you know, concentration correlates with outcomes, and after being trained at Sinai to use cyclosporin, it, it made sense to me, like, well, why aren't we doing with this with, with infliximab? And the, the, the drug uh, testing became available, so I started doing it in my clinical practice where I started dosing patients sort of akin to the taxa trial, but in clinical practice, to a trough concentration of five to 10. Is that the right trough concentration? Not, we don't, I'm not really sure we know, but again, all the data and all the, 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 the negatives of drug, of, of drug levels have been shown with low levels, right? Low levels lead to bad outcomes, antibodies, loss of response. To date, quote, high levels have not been associated with any higher risk of adverse outcomes. Some people thought maybe psoriasis, but again, the data hasn't borne that out. So I went, and, and as the patients rolled in, I sort of talked to them about it, sent off trough concentrations, and dose optimized them. And then we retrospectively compared that group to a group of patients in our IBD center who were getting standard of care, which was empiric dose escalation or reactive testing. And three quarters of the group had uh, empiric dose escalation to 10 megs per kg. But you can see here that the group that got TDM and and dosing to a therapeutic window far outperformed the group that got uh, regular testing. You know, I mean, it, it most, greater than about 90% of the patients remained on drug, and if you look, that little green line is one year, so that's 52 weeks. You can see here the curves really aren't starting to separate until after one year. Again, one of the reasons I think the taxid trial probably uh, didn't fail, and, and uh, probably did sort of miss their primary endpoint. This is the slide Gary showed. Then when we look specifically at those patients that attained a trough concentration of greater than five, they did better than those patients that did not attain a trough concentration of greater than five. They did better than the group that was just receiving standard of care. But the group where they were getting standard of care or that they didn't achieve a trough level of greater than five, they sort of did about the same. And more patients in the standard of care ended up stopping infliximab by the end of the study. All right, and because of the, the, the group from uh, Leuven in Europe, we also looked at trough concentration of three. And the curve's still very separate, but they do start coming a little bit closer together. This is a, a nice model done by a pediatric group just to sort of push home the point. If we're using our typical doses of five mg per kg, this took a, a more sick 10-year-old on the left and just a sort of moderate to severe patient on the right, you're really, you know, just dosing five mg per kg every eight weeks, only 20 to 40% of your patients are gonna have a predicted trough concentration of greater than three. So the vast majority of your patients are gonna be less, a trough concentration of less than three. In order to get adequate, in this case only a trough concentration of three, up to 80%. You needed five makes per kg every four weeks or a model to 10 makes per kg every six weeks. So a lot of our patients due to clearance issues do require more drug than, you know, is sort of what's in the standard labeling. So in my practice, this is what I continue to do, and you can look at this after, but when my patients are rolling in on drug already, I will check them in the maintenance phase and dose optimize them to a level of greater than five. Most of my patients, I'll aim somewhere between five and 10, but we don't know the optimal window. I have a number of patients, 
particularly some of my perianal disease, who require levels of 15. If I drop them below 15, they, they have symptoms or they, you know, I'm starting to see antibody formation. So what about induction? This, like I said, is probably even more important than during the maintenance phase. This is when our patients need more drug, high CRP, low albumin, sick, losing the, the anti-TNF in their stool. And I'll show you a little bit of data that early truck drug concentrations actually correlate with short-term healing and long-term outcomes. Uh, this is uh, a study from Europe where they looked at 19 patients with just moderate to severe UC. 60% had endoscopic response to infliximab, and you can see clearly that those patients that had endoscopic response had higher drug concentrations than those that were not responding. And even within six weeks, six out of the eight of these non-responders already had antibodies to infliximab, right? You get low drug concentration, these antibodies form quickly. Uh, and, and like typically, those patients with higher CRP had lower infliximab concentration. So we really should be optimizing drug concentration and, and optimizing early. And this is akin to ho hospitalized severe UC. Most people are giving 10 mg per kg or an accelerated uh, regimen of 5 mg per kg. This is a, a study recently published by my, my wonderful fellow, Costas, who spent two years in Leuven. This is their data, where you can see early drug concentrations both at week two, six, and, and I think importantly, week 14. Uh, correlate, higher levels correlate with short-term mucosal healing at week 14. Marla has pediatric data that shows week 14 trough concentration of more than seven, had a positive predictive value of 100% for persistent remission at, I think it was 54 weeks. So again, if you can overcome, control the inflammation, keep your drug concentration up, and then importantly follow it in the maintenance phase, these patients are going to do better. So what about optimized monotherapy? I, I remember the first time I sort of talked about this, you know, particularly with the, the, the combination therapy mafia that was out there. It was, it was, it was ugly. But to me, as, as sort of Gil and Gary pointed out, what does combo therapy do, right? What does the immunomodulator do? In, in my mind, and according to a lot of the studies, which I won't show you, combination therapy increases the drug concentration of your anti-TNF and decreases antibody formation, right? Combination therapy is good, but, you know, I have a hard enough time getting my patients to take an anti-TNF, let alone combo therapy, right? Now you're talking about the lymphoma, the skin cancers, the hepatosplenic T cell lymphoma, right? It, it, it makes it more complicated, and the risks, I think, do probably go up. So why not, if all it does is increase drug concentration, why not do that with proactive TDM? and do optimized monotherapy. And from our group of patients, and this was published in the same paper, 31 of our patients at one point in the trial were on monotherapy. 80, and all patients achieved a trough concentration of three that we looked at. 83% achieved a trough of greater than five. And at the end of the study, with a mean follow-up of almost three and a half years, none of these patients had stopped infliximab by the end of the study. It's, again, it's important, particularly if your patients are on monotherapy, there's no safety net, so you, I would continue to follow these typically once or twice a year. What about stopping an immunomodulator? Again, uh, uh, discussed, right? The data for combination therapy being effective is mostly a year. So a lot of us are, are at six months, at a year, talking about, well, can we stop the immunomodulator? There's data out there that if you stop the immunomodulator one or two years later, whether you stopped it or you continued it, the risk of flare is the same. But there's some hints that the combo therapy group's still doing a little bit better. They have lower C-reactive proteins, they have higher anti-TNF concentrations, and I think in the long run, that's going to lead to further loss of response. So what I do is, when, if I have someone on combo and I'm stopping them, or what I'd recommend is checking an anti-TNF concentration before you stop, when you stop the immunomodulator, assume that you're going to drop the concentration of your anti-TNF, at least infliximab, by about half. Take that into account and follow it afterwards. So this is a study published at DDW where they had patients optimized on infliximab and optimized on uh, azathioprine, and they either continued azathioprine on the left, 
have the azathioprine in the middle or stop the azathioprine on the right, and you can see the dose, the median dose of infliximab fell from about four to about two. Importantly, the number of patients with a trough concentration of less than one jumped from about 15% up, up to 40% with a risk of antibody formation, okay? So what about numbers? This is where it gets a little trickier. I tried to keep it simple. For infliximab and adalimumab, we can talk about the others if you want after. Clinical remission, I would aim and for, and this is in, in maintenance phase, I would aim for at least five. Deeper remission, you probably, in some patients, in the higher levels, maybe greater than eight. At week 14, I would say at least seven. In my personal practice, I aim for over about 10. Adalimumab, the numbers look the same, except uh, for clinical remission, I aim for five. Deeper remission, I aim for about eight to 10, even push it above 12. And week four, where I check it, I wanna see it at least seven to 10, similar to uh, the infliximab. If you wanna see some of the data where I came up with those numbers, it's here. And I'm gonna be very clear, I put a uh, question mark in there on purpose, because we do have issues. We don't know what the optimal trough concentration windows are. Some people, need more drug than others. When do we test it? I would say certainly by week 14, but to be honest, in my sicker patients, I'm checking week 12, I'm checking week 10. We need a test certainly that's accurate, accessible, inexpensive, doesn't cost our patients $250 every time we do it, and, and we always like uh, TDM. Uh, sorry, we, um, so know what tests you use. It's important to know whether you have a drug tolerant assay and it can measure antibodies in the presence of drug. Know the cost, particularly to your patient. Know what to do with the results. We've, we've talked about it and I'll show you the website. You can go through, plug in the clinical scenario, the, the, the anti-TNF concentration and the antibodies and we'll sort of go through and tell you which is inappropriate, uncertain or inappropriate. I would say if nothing else, test reactively, but I would really start trying to get people to really push the proactive testing, both certainly during maintenance as well as induction. And, and I'm gonna quote Jean-Fred as well, something that I, I didn't think he would hear. He, he, he agrees now, I think, that it's, it's all about the, the levels. And that's the, that's the website to, to go to to play around.